All right, there we are. We are live. Welcome everybody to an ep another episode of Live. I am Josh Hayes here with my co-host, fantastic science fiction author Scott <laughs> Moon, right there, and we are here today with uh, author Jacob Cooper, the author of the Osiron War, War series and the Dying Lands Chronicles. Welcome, Jacob. Hey, thanks, guys. Good to be with you. It's uh, I was telling. Scott, right before you came back on, I think this is the first day we've ever not had technical difficulties on our show. So, oh, just just wait. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's because of you or something we did, but <laughs> hopefully it's just a matter just of wait. tweaking a few things and getting a few things just just right today. I uh, I have a new computer. I don't know everybody everybody wanted to know about that, so I'm pretty excited. Josh talked me into getting a Mac. And I have my there you I go. have my I have my PC laptop off to the side, which you know I have you know show notes and things on. But um, I just managed to pour coffee on it, so oh, <laughs> fantastic. That's my technical difficulty today. That's It'll probably to manifest start. later. And so, really, that's the best thing to do to a PC is just yeah, use it as coffee. You, I thought you would like. I thought you, ooh, some got some got on my handy dandy little iMac. <laughs> just a little stain. Nice. All right, so that, that's how I roll right there. A accidents and spills. So. Um, Beautiful thing. Yeah. Well, uh, um, I don't know anybody who's watched our show before. Josh and I are huge audiobook fans. Um, I started listening to audiobooks a long time ago um, as a kid, and we got so into them with my family that if we couldn't get an audiobook on a long trip, because we did a lot of driving living out here in Kansas, yeah, we would actually read the books back and forth to each other, me and my mom. Really? So, yeah, yeah. So I, I love audio books, and I'm going to start out just by kind of asking you to tell a little bit about yourself. And I mean, you can start with you know write, your writing, because that's a big deal too, or your audio books or whatever you want to go if you want to just uh, give us something. Oh, we're doing a, we're doing a giveaway today. Um, we are. So uh, sorry, my, my lighting is bad, but uh, we'll give it oh, away. That's... Altar of Influence, the Osarian War. That's they were very doing cool. An Amazon giveaway, I think. That the lighting actually kind of kind of does good good for that book. It makes it look intense. Yeah. It's mysterious. <laughs> yeah, so um, I I started writing in 2009 or so, and I was kind of on the the way home from work and had this this crazy idea for a chase scene. And years before, I had had this vivid dream about me and my um, my oldest daughter. And we were just, just crazy running in the forest, and, and we were uh, running from this kidnapper guy. And uh, anyway, I, it was a very vivid dream. It was a scary dream, and I got home, and I you know, I wrote that dream out a, a long time ago. So anyway, on the way home from work in, like, August of 2009, I, I think inspired by that crazy dream, I had this chase scene idea. Mm -hmm. And I never thought about writing, but, but it was to me, it was like it was such a cool kind of setting in my mind, and I just wrote out this five-page uh, opening chase scene, and um, it later became chapter one. It was my prologue at one point, but and, mm -hmm. and it's much expanded now, but I sent it to a few people who I know are extremely critical, including some of my brothers, and, <laughs> uh, and all of them said, uh, yeah, more, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you think so, and they're like, definitely. So it's, like the, it's like the creative mood. Creative Muse just reached out and kind of slapped you sideways there, and you went with it. A little bit. I, I wasn't a real talented author, and I, I still, I'm still growing a, a ton. I mean, I, I go back now, and I, and it took five years before Circle of Rain. That became Circle of Rain. It right. took five years before it was published. I was just writing discovery mode like crazy. I had no idea where the book was going. None. I, I just kept writing and writing and writing, and things that came to me at the very end of the book, I said, wow, that, I, I love that, and I had to go work them in. Yeah. You got to salt them back in. So that, the book. So uh, I'm going to jump way ahead. Uh, you're a discovery writer or a planner? So <laughs> I, I started out being discovery and and uh, very proud of that, right? And um, that's right. When it came time to write uh, the uh, the Osarian War, which later was renamed to Altar of Influence, with the Osarian War being a subtitle. You know, I, I sat down and I outlined that thing, and I because I, I, I thought it was just going to be kind of a short story, a novella at most, mm -hmm. and I outlined it. And what I found is the writing went so much faster. I, I was it was it was eight months of writing instead of five years, 
it, it was just it was just so much faster. And yet at the same time, I, I had an outline, a platform to stand upon. But that didn't mean I didn't discover new things and kind of take take an off ramp, you know. And oh yeah. It, it just it, when things hit, you guys understand, and you take that okay. off ramp. But you can come back because you have you, you know where you're trying to get by the outline. So I've kind of. I guess I'm somewhat in between, but I've started outlining like crazy, mm -hmm. leaving myself enough flexibility to take that off ramp of discovery and come back. Yeah, that's, right. that's the way I pretty much started out writing. Also, not really knowing what I was doing, and then having it take forever, and then you yeah. get half. You, you yeah. spend so much time getting halfway through the book, and then you realize you have no idea where you're going, and I've just wasted all this time. I'd rather right. spend all that time playing it all the way out. So for I guess it's a question for either one of you. What's the best way if you're to adjust your outline as you go? Because I'm assuming you have to adjust it. I, I know I know I do. I get so far away from my outline sometimes that it's almost like I have to start outlining over from the beginning. Well, yeah, you're, you, th this is what'll happen with your outline. Um, you will write the outline, but your characters will correct it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's very true. I I have had that happen so many times, and I thought I knew where I was going, and the characters corrected me, and it was so much better. And and so I just I just think you know not being so strict to sticking to that outline, like like you know come hell or high water kind of thing. Right. Just understand you know blessed are the flexible for they shall not be bent out of shape. <laughs> you know, I, I go with that. Write that down. That's a good yeah, one. Yeah, let's put that down. <laughs> Quote of the day. Right yeah, that's actually a good point because I, I think a lot of people get when we when you talk about uh, outlining or or pantsing a novel. Discovery, yeah. yeah, a lot of people get ate up and they're like, oh, I can't I can't outline because then the joy of writing and discovering how the story goes is just thrown out the window. And I don't agree with that. I think if you can if you can write your outline and, and know a little bit about where you're going, it's I mean it's not like a so uh, yeah. So here, here's what I do at the beginning of every writing session. This is how I used to struggle to get a thousand words in a day, and sometimes that still happens. But now I get three to four thousand in in a single writing session. That's good. It, the, the way that that happens is I have my outline, but then I take like 20 minutes before um, I, my writing session, and I outline in more detail what that writing session is going to do. So I outline the writing session. Um, and and I it's usually just action action action. So I write the action out, mm -hmm. and I don't worry too much about descriptions and things like that yet. And that that's later. So I just want to even on paper I'll just start saying this is this happens then this then this then this then this, and I write. And then I go back and add filler 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 with descriptions and moods and things. Anyway, that's how I do it. I, I put meat mm -hmm. on the bone after the bone is there. Kind of like a, a modified snowflake method, method yeah. where you where yeah. you come out and you get just the bare bones, and then you right. go back and add all the rest of the flavor into it. That's exactly seen right. seen. Yeah, I I was I was a, of course a Stephen King on writing big fan from the beginning, and sure. I would I would just go I was too impatient to outline in. Um, but it seems like if I'm beta reading a book right now by Stuart Horwitz. He wrote the book called Blueprint Your Blueprint Your Best Seller, um, and okay. uh, in book architecture, and he has a third one now, and it's basically it's a three draft book, and he talks about your messy first draft. So uh, yeah. you got a messy first draft. Uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, how many we had uh, on, on how you do it? I mean, everybody's drafts first drafts are a little bit different. Um, when I first started writing, I started at the beginning doing that, doing that, uh, just kind of seat of my pants stuff, and my yeah. first 30,000 words were very well polished because I kept going back to the beginning. Every that's time. right. That's right. Yeah. And that's okay, and that's actually a good way to overcome writer's block too is you just, instead of trying to, to write, uh, you simply start going over what you've already written and just kind of tweaking and tweaking and tweaking. And then, right. you know, the muse will strike for me often when I do that. The other way I overcome writer's block is I write a short story. Oh, yeah. um, and it, usually it's in the world of the series that I'm currently working on, The Dying Lines Chronicle. Um, but it doesn't have to be. And it, it, the point is to just start writing uh, and, and getting some juices flowing. And actually, that's where my, my two short stories that are out right now, The Red Grove and Remnants and Shadows, both mm -hmm. of those came from writer's block. I saw you had a couple up there that were in the same universe. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have uh, I have two questions on that, that line. The first one is... Uh, in reference to your novels or any of your drafts, how many drafts do you normally go through until it's complete? We had Ben Hale on the show um, sure. last yeah. week, 
I actually, by doing when I was doing my research for this show, I, sh- I saw that you guys had done an interview, uh, yeah. what a year ago or something like that. So that's kind of neat. But uh, he said he went through, I want to say like thirteen drafts or something yeah. until his was done. How was, how many had, do you he usually had a process a very regimented process of drafts? That he just yeah, he out. he does. Um... You know, Ben uh, says he's outlined 13 books, I think, over 50,000 year time span. Right. And and that's an advantage to him because he knows um, the beginning from the end very, very well. I, I think he spent 10 years outlining. I, I am not that meticulous. Um, sometimes I'll just write for the sake of, of writing and discovering something. So I, I still do that. Um I don't know how many drafts. I, I you know, I, I had a draft that I thought was the draft for Circle of Rain. I thought it was good. I sent it to a, a great author named Mike Sirota, uh, who was helping me, and came back and said, "No, this is this is a rough draft." And it might have been my sixth or seventh, right? Right. And so I'm like, "Oh, that sucks." But uh, he, like, you thanks know, for the encouragement. Yeah, well, just punch it, me it was eye. good. I mean, you, you got to do this, right? You got to like right. have guys who who are not afraid to offend you, who are not afraid to. Uh, really challenge you is really what it is. I mean, it, right. you're you know when you're getting constructive feedback, you're not being torn down. You're being challenged, and and I mm-hmm. the book became so much better, and and then I finally released it, and it, since then it caught the attention of David Farland, who's you know famous for his Rune Lords oh, series, yeah. wrote some Star Wars books, some X Files, um, and and he taught Brandon Sanderson and Brandon Mole, helped Stephanie Meyer uh, along the way, is is what I understand, and. Anyway, he became interested in Circle of Rain, and this was this was huge to me because it, n- number one, it stopped my progress on book two, which is called Song of Night. Mm-hmm. Much to my fans' dismay, and sometimes they swear at me and say, "Where where is book two?" Right? And you know, very very emphatic language. And uh, right. on on the, on the good note, though, <laughs> you're put into the same category as George R. R. Martin when it comes to something like that. <laughs> so, or, so that's good company to have. Or Rothfuss. <laughs> come on, man. Give us where's? <laughs> come on. <laughs> you got the pace. Give us I, some I more need books. Both, right? Yeah, um, yeah. But uh, yeah, you know, it, it it stopped my progress. But the opportunity to work with someone who's very renowned, very respected, and loved as a teacher and mentor, and he happens to live locally to me was uh, something I couldn't pass up. And he said, look, I, I think Circle of Rain is a good book, and I think there are some weaknesses, which I, I, I knew that. I was a first-time author. I knew that. I'm proud of it. But right. my, I knew it wasn't perfect. Um, it was just the best I could at the time. And we have gone through a rewrite with him over the past seven or eight months. He's done with his part. I'm simply polishing and adding the things. You know, I'm, I'm executing uh, on the ideas and right. so Circle of Rain is so much better. It is so much tighter. I can't wait to re-release it, which leads us to kind of a a, a decent sized announcement here is that uh, a a major uh, player has approached me about my entire series and made an offer and I think I think I'm going to take it. Um, That's awesome! Congratulations! That's they, well, they've fantastic. Been, They've, they've decided, uh, they've agreed to, to do the rewrites. Usually, you know, a publisher is not going to want to uh, take existing books. They're just, they just shy right. away from that, um, from my experience anyway. Right. Yeah. And uh, anyway, they've, they've very graciously uh, come and said, yeah, we're going to, we'll do the reproduction of the audio book and all this stuff, and mm-hmm. we'll, we'll do that, and, and we want books two and three as well. And so mm-hmm. we're coming close. That's pretty impressive, though. But you know, to to get the attention of of, of the big boys like that or big girls, however you want to put it, um, the uh, that I mean, that's a big deal. It means you got some good writing and you got a a good platform. Obviously, you reach out and connect. With I hope so. So now you say he found he found you and he started working with you. Do you know how he found you? Like what? No, no, yeah. So let me uh, be real clear. I banged down his door. <laughs> <laughs> found me after I attacked him. And so, uh, you so know, it's I more mean, like a stalking than a oh hi. Yeah, it was all right. So, well, like no higher pitch, but with like he he, he became interested in it once I very emphatically and consistently told him I am going to come see him at his house unless he starts working <laughs> with it. No, not not quite that crazy, but I, I I was very insistent that that I would be a good student if he worked with me one on one, and mm-hmm. eventually he said. All right, all right. Let's let's look at this. He read the first thirty to fifty pages, as he tells it, and came back to me and said, 
Yes. Yes, yes, wow. yes, yes. How That's good did that feel? Good. Uh, it, felt, it felt amazing. It was, was a pretty good day. So did you do something to celebrate? Yeah, like some kind of happy dance. I don't know. You don't. Want to say it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it was like that. early on, when I uh, approached Michael Kramer about mm -hmm. doing my audio books, I he I wasn't sure if he could do a non-union gig or or not. And I I found him on Facebook and we started talking. And right. he went and checked and said, Yeah, but let me just read it to make sure I I think it's okay and it's a fit for me. Um, he came back to me and said this, and I, this was you got to understand. I mean, as a first-time author loving Brandon Sanderson just really loving him and wanting that same voice from Mistborn and Way of Kings to do my book um, he came back and said I'm very excited about this I had to apply the Sanderson rule which is don't start reading late at night because you'll be up until 3 a.m. <laughs> you, know, you know just knowing this guy had narrated so many books but but a lot of Sanderson books and things that I loved Saying that he, he was up till three and four in the morning reading my book, he was just he couldn't stop. I I was blown away. I was That's so awesome. Humbled. You That's got fantastic. your Brandon Sanderson sign. Uh, I was just I was just looking for my fanboy sign, and we're Brandon. huge Sanderson fanboys yeah. on the show. We've yeah. read the themes. the Final Empire and his first series. We uh, I absolutely love Brandon. Well, Sanderson. I, I got to tell you guys, it was after that uh, after reading Mistborn. See, I, I I like to create things. I'm I'm a musician, and I'm I'm not much of a artist in the painting or drawing sense but mm -hmm. I've always loved to create things and I and I love to imitate what inspires me so so if I heard music that was just to me just awesome and moving and inspiring you I would, yeah, I would sit down at the piano and I'd try to write something in that vein right and, and that was yeah. my way of in a way honoring it right mm -hmm. I mean is creating something that that is probably nowhere near as good, but but in that vein. But that's the whole point is to be inspired and then to go yeah. forward with something. You know, you read a good story, you want to you want to enjoy the story, you want to tell the story. Same with music and stuff like that. I mean, that's that, that that's what happened with my writing with with Mistborn. I had finished it and I had never been. I didn't grow up this massive avid reader. I didn't grow up reading fantasy. I didn't grow up playing Dungeons and Dragons. I read White Fang because I had to. I read To Kill a Mockingbird <laughs> because I had to. Right. I I didn't, I didn't grow up this evasion you know revacious reader. My, some of my brothers. Others were, but not me. And so, it, mm -hmm. anyway, I was like 30 years old. I finished Mistborn, and it was the first time I had been, I, I listened to it, I had been right. transported. I, I really had, I felt a part of that story and world like like never before in anything. Let me and ask you this, in, in, in reference to the Final Empire, the first trilogy, let me ask you this, because I listened to all three, and yeah. uh, that's how normally I do all my reading is audio books. So me I... Too. I listened to the first one, and it took me, I want to say it took me maybe two weeks to get to the first one, just because it's so long, um, and I and I was, you know, I listened to it on the way back from uh, work, and I finished the first one, and I was blown away after I finished The Final Empire, uh -huh. and I was extremely hesitant to start the second one, because <laughs> I was like, there's no way the second book can be as good as the first one. And then I listened to the second book, and I was like, okay, I'm not reading the third one because there's absolutely no way that the third <laughs> one could be as good as the second one. And I, I was blown away by all three. They were fantastic. I think I saw a lot of growth uh, from Sanderson as he as he went through those books. I, yeah. I just, I I just uh, anyway, it inspired me to to try writing. That, Mike, that right Michael there. Kramer read that book also. Yeah, 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 he did. I've, I've been listening to Michael Kramer for a long time because he, he did the Wheel of Time books. Yes, as well. Yeah, him and him and Kate Redding and uh, right. Yeah, you you know it's interesting when you listen to audiobooks enough. You when you have your own thoughts, you start hearing your thoughts in the voice of your narrators that you listen to. All <laughs> yeah, <the time>. yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> well, coming back to your story, you've written the is it the two novels and the two short stories, or the one novel and two short stories? So, Altar of Influence and Circle of Rain are both full-length novels, and then the Red Grove and Remnants and Shadows are short stories that are kind of like missing chapters. The Red Grove is, uh, I would say, a you know a cut scene of of Circle of Rain, and same with Remnants and Shadows is kind of a, mm -hmm. a you know a cut scene of uh, of uh, Altar of Influence. Um, yeah, that's what I have right now. And uh, out of the out of the two mediums, uh, novel length and short story length, what do you have a, a preferred style, or do you like both of them equally? Yeah, I, oh, the the full length novel. It's just harder to do. In fact, <clears throat> when I uh, discovered the, the short stories, both of which I released after the first two full length novels, um, mm -hmm. I really discovered a love of of writing short stories. Again, it's a way for me to overcome writer's block, but. 
and now I kind of write scenes as if they were independent short stories right. in my full length books, and and then I make sure that they weave together. Oh yeah, I got a beginning, middle, and an end, and maybe something that hooks you on into the next yeah, scene. Yeah, yeah. There, there's got to be some kind of hook. You you can't just be out there displaying information, exposing information, even if yeah. it's funny or or eerie a little bit, which I kind of like it. There has to be some kind of turn and move the story forward, keep the reader hooked a little bit. I've read right. some place that everything in your in your story's got to do a job, and if it's not doing something, whether it's you know super entertaining or getting some information or advancing the plot or raising attention, but um, and you can kind of tell, yeah, um, with some of the literary stuff I've read read in college and other places that I'm like, what is the point of this last 50 pages? I just you read? kind of always got to ask that. Yeah, and it, you know that's a good life, uh, a life thing too. It's like, mm -hmm. what, what, what is the point of what I'm doing right. right now? What is, you know, my my efforts? What is their ultimate mm -hmm. point? If you, if you don't have, I mean, writing is like is really a roadmap for life. I've found the process of it, you and if it. you if you don't have, you know, are, are you know, what's the purpose of what you're doing? Uh, in your after work, are you just are you just sitting sitting there playing video games all night long, or watching right. reruns of Friends all night long? What's the point of that? Yeah. I mean, th th there's a point of of kicking back and relaxing for a little bit. That that that's good. Recreation sure. is good, but you know, I mean, th th so this is also why I loved starting to write, having never ever thought I would as as a kid, never really thought about it. Is I, I actually did something productive for me. It bettered me. Right. Mm -hmm. And I could have been doing a lot of just garbage. It just means nothing. Yeah. Writing is so time intensive. It'll make you appreciate the value of time and That's make right. you make you live more intentionally because you're like, okay, this is going to take me 100 hours for my first rough draft. Uh, where can I squeeze that in? <laughs> At least, right? Well, that's, I think that's the biggest question you hear from uh, beginning writers or people that, that haven't started writing is I don't have any time to write. And it's, you have time, you just have to... You gotta make it. You have to make the time for you gotta it. Choose. I also lost a lot of sleep. Yeah. You know? I mean, <laughs> that's true, I did. Oh, yeah. Now, these two yeah. books being your first uh, book, Altar of Influence, and uh, now I'm drawing a blank on the other one. Circle of Rain. Circle of Rain. Come uh, on, man. Circle of Rain's book one and Altar of Influence. Hold up that zero. big poster. Just hold that up so I can read it next time. Here we go. So, right, here we I'll go. forget. Oh, yeah, there we go. Oh, see. Yeah. There, there you go. See, and I want to talk about that. Um, so, awesome. so when we talked yesterday, I asked you if you are you were indie or traditional, and you said indie. And I was blown away because the val the – the, the way your covers quality. present themselves, the quality of your product is, I think, heads and tails, heads and shoulders, rather, over a lot of the products that you find on Amazon or anywhere else. Can you tell us Thank a little you. bit about, you know, yeah. creating how does, that product? How does some, yeah, how does somebody um, get that, whether you're a traditional or indie, how do you get to that type of product? Well, I, t I tell you what, John Avon, or Avon, uh, I think he says he's a good chap across the ocean, uh, British, he he's done Stephen King covers. He's done book covers for thirty years, as well as lots of lots of art. And I, I just found him, uh, John Avon, on the web. I approached him and uh, several other artists. I liked his work, um, he, and it was pricey. But let me just tell you, I my philosophy was, I I'm unknown. People mm -hmm. don't know me. I wanted to put as many brand names as possible around my That's works. Your, right. And and yes, it costs money. I mean, Michael Kramer was not cheap, but it was so worth it. Right. Uh, John Avon was not cheap, but it was so worth it. I had many people say I picked up the book just because of the cover, and they were willing to give it a shot. And so, look, it, it's it's kind of like this thing where they say don't judge a book by cover. Yeah, this wonderful advice you shouldn't, but we do. Yeah. We all do. Yeah, everybody well, does it. Well, it, it, is, it either shortly. drags you in or it doesn't, right? I mean, the, the cover has one job. The cover, the, the job of the cover is to intrigue someone enough to pick it up yep. and hold it or to click on it on Amazon. It has one job. From there, they're going to read the, the, the blurb on the back. And that's your job to keep. And from there, if, if they're interested, they're going to read the first couple of pages of the prologue right. or chapter one. Right. I mean, but, so that's kind of your job as a writer, but I didn't want to give anyone an excuse to not give me a fair shake. you got to get them to that first page before you yeah, can show your stuff. 
I, I couldn't be more pleased. And so John Avon's fans know about my books, right? He has, I don't know, 20,000 plus fans on Facebook. And I was able to cool. tap into that. I mean, you got to think marketing here in, in business. Mm -hmm. And of course, Michael Kramer is well loved. And I know on Audible, I know a, a huge majority of people picked up the audiobook just because of him because they didn't know me. Right. You know, well, he, if, you, if you see if you see Michael Kramer on audiobook, your your first thought is professionally made book because right. he's a professional. Right. He's got a long experience. This this uh, kind of fishtails into something I noticed before. I picked up one of the books that you narrated last night. I, I picked it up last night, not that you narrated it last night, right. <laughs> but um, but the one of the reasons I selected us like which one should I pick? And so I was reading the reviews, and one of the readers, one of the reviewers said, I picked this book up because of the narrator and then I love the book and so uh -huh. that's what a good narrator can do for you right and I thought I thought well you know this says something about about his skill as a narrator and so I picked it up and I, and I enjoy it and I've listened to a lot of audiobooks so that's a that's a compliment so I hope, I hope it, it is thank you yeah I, I, I don't narrate under my name I well I narrate under a stage name Keith Mickelson or Michelson mm -hmm. if you if you prefer oh, sure. Mr. Mickelson Mr. yeah <laughs> Well, it's because I've always been pretty good at doing the Irish thing. <laughs> I can't. I, <laughs> I completely awesome. threw it away, and he knocked it out of the park. Yeah, that's badass. It's the red beard, man. It's yeah. <laughs> that's fantastic. So well, you, that's the thing about audio. Voice? Are you good at voices? Somebody's always been good at doing voices. Because I know when I, when I listen to your book, one of the things that I listen for is can I listen to an audiobook narrator for a long time and their cadence is good and, and it right. just flows and it doesn't distract me and and when I listen to you narrate I'm like it fits that perfectly and I haven't got far enough Thank in there you. to hear you do a lot of voices and I know some people think if I can do a if I can do great voices then I can be a book narrator I'm not sure that's true 100 percent well okay so um I started narrating last year because I, I I bought a studio little thing. I bought an awesome Neumann mic, and I had always used Pro Tools for music. And people ask all the time, how did I get into narrating? I just set up camp and said, here I am. <laughs> um, I started yeah. auditioning on ACX, uh, which is the, the retail uh, or the self-published end of, of Audible. Right. Um, and, you know, I just started sending out auditions. I started letting everyone know. I started letting my writing groups know. And I, I think I've done 15 or 16 books now. I have a 10-book contract with a great uh, small press out of the U.K. called Tickety Boo Press. Right. Uh, very, well, uh, very honored by Ralph that Kern's and excited. Ralph Kern is, is with TBP and Kramer did. This is interesting. Michael Kramer did Endeavor by Ralph Kern. I picked up Endeavor simply because of that. Loved it. Started a relationship with Ralph Kern over Facebook. Interviewed him. We became good buds. Uh, that introduced me to Gary Compton at Tickety Boo Press. And uh, that led to some audio work for me. And I just finished mm -hmm. Uncommon Purpose by PJ Streber, which was a really good character driven. Uh, military sci-fi, space sci-fi. Anyway, I just, uh, it, it was a lot of fun. And yes, I love voices. I, I love doing voices. I'm better at some than others. Mm -hmm. uh, for whatever reason, my Latino Hispanic is, is not that good. I, you know, I, and I lived in Southern California for 12 years. I, you know, have lots of friends that are of that uh, ethnicity. And right. I just, I don't know. It's a little tougher for me. But uh, It's amazing in this line of work what one or two chance meetings or connections will do for you. Yeah. yeah. It, well, and, and we met you through Ralph Kern. That's right. Uh, who was our first guest on the show. Ralph's and uh, I, I read his book really not knowing who he was. I just picked it up and read it yeah. and I thought it was fantastic. And I sent him a message and asked if he wanted to be on the show. And then right. through him, he said, Oh, I know this person. You want to know this person? I've got this person. <laughs> so, uh, He's a it's good guy. it's great, and we talked about this on our show before. Is that in this line of work, it seems that most people are in it to help themselves, but to also, if they can help somebody else along the way, they're gonna do it. I found that. And, yeah. And they're not even. I mean, they're gonna do it without asking for anything. They're just gonna be like, "Oh, can I help you?" And then do it, and then yeah. It's, yeah. The best thing about about this this as a as a profession, I think, is that. It's not a zero-sum game. It's it's not mutual exclusive. You know, um, you can you know people that like you know if you especially if you find writers in the same similar genres. You know, somebody reads my book, they might they can read Josh's book. They don't have to pick; they can read them both. You know, they right. can read your books, and uh, and I, I've been writing for a very long time, and I wrote kind of literally in my closet. Um, 
but you know today today's for writing is so much different because you can actually have a social network of writers and that's amazing that's been really valuable to me and and some some I've made very good connections with like um you know, I, I narrated Charlie Pulsifer's books, the uh, Lost Shard series, and Charlie is oh, is man. a fantastic writer. I mean, if you if you you know want to read an epic sci-fi and fantasy mix in seventy to eighty thousand words, and it still feels epic, it's not one hundred ninety like my books, a thousand words. I mean, he he is so talented at that, and he's he's a great inspiration in many ways. And uh, Who, this, who's that? Charlie Pulsifer. Um, and then uh, Davis Asura, I mean, uh, who wrote uh, the Cast and the Outcast series. Uh, Nick Podell narrated his books. He, Davis and I become good buds over. He read my book, mentioned it on a forum. He read <laughs> Circle of Rain, started talking about it on a forum in, in response to some other guys. I was like, you know, I, hey, do you have an audio book out? Because I'm not going to read your book, but I'll listen to it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, I just, it's not like that. But anyway, um, he got Nick Podell to do it, who did Name of the Wind, and I listened to it, and I was just blown away. And then the second book came out, I was blown away. And anyway, Davis Asher and I are good buds now, and, you know, we, we text each other uh, several times a week back and forth, just being like, hey, what about this scene? And we'll tell each other a little bit about it, and we'll say, no, that sucks, or yeah, that's great. And that has been invaluable. That's awesome. It's all, it is awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool. I, I, I like that a lot. You know, my favorite day of the week is this show, and then, you know, and then and I obviously love writing, but just bouncing these ideas around and talking to people, you know, it's, sure. it's awesome. So good times. I've got to give a shout out to the fans real quick. I. You guys have been awesome, and I love interacting with you. I interact daily on Facebook, a little bit on Twitter, but oh my goodness. I, I that If you want to know what the most rewarding thing is, it's having accomplished something that I love and am proud of. But definitely a very close second is the interaction and the friends I have developed among fans and checking in with them. Love you guys. This is oh, awesome. Yeah. Well, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for the fans. So That's right. And they, right. they, uh, and they apparently love your audiobooks because you got like what now, thirteen hundred and some reviews. Yeah, uh, rating, and, ratings and reviews. Yep. And and ratings, ratings and reviews, and um, you know, any writers like loves getting lots of reviews, and um, so that's impressive. I mean, that's just that's, thanks. It's hard. It's hard to uh, really for somebody who's not into writing, or in this business, you know. Um, like some of the guys we know work, Josh, they don't really appreciate the kind of accomplishment that is. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> what? Um, yeah, that, and that's a good that's a good point. Is that your your audio book kind of like um, Andy Weir's The Martian? Your audio book has kind of taken off and it kind of developed a, a life of its own. Um, for uh, versus your eBooks. What uh, is there any marketing that you do uh, consistently, or anything that, that would make that audiobook push, or do you think it was just because you had Michael Kramer do the narration? I, I mean, I definitely think that was a lot of it. Um, I think the length of the book has a lot of it to do with it too. Uh, people who like epic fantasy um, like longer books. Uh, Circle of Rain is over 20 hours long um, in in audio format. I've had people say they. They want to pick it up unless it was at least, you know, 15, right? And and right, yeah. if it were 30, even better. Um, so there's some of that. Yes, I did do a lot of Facebook marketing. Um, I had saved up. I, I understand that best-selling author, that best-selling is a verb. And right. you, unfortunately, right. if you're, a, let's put it this way, and maybe this is a little sad, but if you are a better marketer, than you are an author, but it, but at least a decent author. But if you're a better marketer, mm -hmm. you're going to have more success than people that are twice as good as you oh, yeah. at writing in general. Now that sometimes that doesn't prove to be true, but most of the time it does. People yeah, have to I, see I, it. I, I They're not going to enjoy it if they don't see it. So you got to get out there. You're a musician. You play what the piano? Piano and percussion, mostly percussion. Piano percussion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you'll, you'll you'll get this. I had a revelation. I've talked about this before on the show. When I was a teenager, I went to L.A. to go play guitar at the Musicians Institute. Sure. Oh, yeah. And I, and I remember walking down Hollywood Boulevard, and I looked right, and I looked left, and I just saw guys with guitars All everywhere. Over the place. Yep. Down and I'm like, dozen. every one of them is as good as me or ten times better. I mean, and you know, they can play Van Halen, Yngwie Malmsteen, and Metallica, and like just like it's nothing. I'm like, you know what? There's more to this scenario than talent. Some of it might be dedication, and I didn't know what it was back then. Um, but so you're you're right. Talent is very important, but you also got to do some work. Yeah, you, you got to market. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But 
my, the biggest takeaway I'm getting out of this show so far is that it seems like your biggest marketing, your first step is creating a, such an awesome product. And I think that's that's for, that's yeah. Mark, to start with that. Yeah, I mean, for for me, it was it was always about that. I I, I love doing things at a high level if I can. At, at the highest level, I can. And so I I saved money. I I prepared mm -hmm. uh, for a marketing campaign for a book cover that that truly cost me thousands, and for a audiobook production that I knew would cost me thousands. And I I don't regret it one bit. I mean. There's actually an article out there uh, when I hit number one in epic fantasy and sci-fi fantasy on Audible. I, I got to tell you guys, this That's was cool. January 2015. I woke up one day, and I was Circle of Rain was number one, and below that was Fellowship of the Ring, and below Holy that <laughs> was, Game, was Game of Thrones, screenshot. and below that was The Martian. You know, and I just you're right. I'm screenshot, screenshot, screenshot. <laughs> I still have those. I mean, I, I don't know why I haven't framed them, but I mean, I'm have that tattooed on my arm. I <laughs> you know, I, well, it, it it lasted a week, right? I mean, it, it lasted a week, and that was I say my my 15 minutes, and and then it went back to normal where I was still decently rated, but wasn't wasn't number one. But waking up and seeing yourself at number one, and seeing Game of Thrones at two. In epic fantasy, and then switching over to the larger genre of sci-fi fantasy, and seeing you at number one and The Martian at number two, was mind blowing. It was humbling. It it was, I, I mean, I can't tell you what kind of happy dance I did that day. I I, <laughs> I, I tell you, I'd, I I don't think I'd be able to stand still. I'd be out running in the streets, yelling and I screaming. I was. I was just. I yeah. was ecstatic. What? So did, had you done anything for that, or did it just well, happen organically? I, I guess I guess, and I I don't understand how this happens, but I guess the book had been doing so decently well on Audible. They come al came along and s chose it for the daily deal. Now you oh, gotta yeah. you gotta understand what this means if if, if you don't out there. There there's over three hundred thousand titles on Audible, and there's only three hundred sixty five days in a year. Yep. Your chance of getting and and that that catalog grows every year, but the days in the year don't grow. Right. So it's and about it's, a a third percent chance. As, I mean, something like that. Less maybe. Very uh, minuscule. I, I'm doing math's not my strong point, I'm, but I'm, I'm not doing correct math here. That, that's a big deal. To, my to me, mathematization is like your mathematization. <laughs> so I give credit. So, someone at Audible noticed the book. Some they thought it was a production. I called in later after that day and said. Thank you so much for choosing us. I don't know how that gets done, and they're like, "Yeah, it's our secret, and we don't tell people. You can't, you can't call us and tell us to do it. You can't pay for it." And I was like, "I'm just so grateful." And they said, "You know, we only do this for books of the highest quality, and and so you can really take it as a compliment." And I, again, that reaffirmed to me that the money I spent making this as good of a product as I could, because I wasn't a well-known deal, but putting high-quality people around me was the answer for me. Well, a lot of people. What a lot of people don't know is that um, places like Audible and Kobo and all the and Amazon, even to a certain extent, they're all looking to do that. I mean, they do. They have divisions that look for something to make a success every day. Mark Lefave, he he spoke at an uh, event I went to recently, and he talks about that. He says they they want to find somebody they think is really talented, and then they want to give them a big boost, and then when they succeed, he said everybody in the office does a happy dance. Like you know, because that that That's makes everybody win, you know. Yeah. And so they're looking for people to do that stuff. It's not just Amazon. It's it's all the all the uh, platforms um, want want they want superstars in their in their stable, I guess, so to speak. But sure. you know, and then when you get uh, just a little bit of notoriety or and uh, a little bit of fan base, I mean, the, the world kind of opens up to you. It, well, and and not not only with the connections with other authors, but with fans, because those fans have connections. Um, and I talked with, uh, I didn't tell you about this yesterday, but I'm going to surprise you with it now. I talked with, uh, <laughs> oh, no. uh, bing, uh, Nathan, uh, Highstead. Uh -huh. That's how you say his last name. Yeah. And he is running an anthology right now called Explorations Through the Wormhole. Yes. And, uh, I know that you have been picked up, uh, for that anthology. It's a sci right. science fiction anthology. Uh, I also, full disclosure, have been picked up for that as well. Um, and Ralph Kern, and I want to say Richard Fox, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Yep. Uh, Stephen Moss as well. 
I mean, that, all those phenomenal names that are going to be on that anthology, it's going to be out, I want to say, at the in the middle of the summer or the end of the summer, depending on when he gets his yeah. submissions in. Right. So, I, like, that kind of... I mean, I, I, when I hooked up with Ralph Kern and, and we started talking and he read my stuff and he said, hey, I think you'd be a great fit for this. And uh, it, th those kind of connections are invaluable. Very important. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a... Um, this isn't a... Uh, crabs in the bucket thing, you know, two crabs in the bucket will never escape because they'll always pull each other down. Yeah, right. Um, instead of like they the could corporate world. Yeah. Corporate world's it, like that. This isn't that. I mean, um, if uh, if I succeed and, and my influ my network of people that I'm with can somehow benefit, we, we just do that. We turn around and and say, hey, I, I think this and this guy will be good for this opportunity as well. It, it's really neat. So talking about opportunities, you do... Uh, Along with your great books, you do the audible narrations. Yeah. Um, what do you have a favorite genre or a length of books? A your book is what do you say, 190,000 words. How right. long would it take you to narrate that? Uh, tw 21 hours or so. Well, how long? Well, so the finished product is 21 <laughs> hours. Um, you can say three to four hours per finished hour. Okay. And, and that's because, not because of of the actual production, the, the reading, it's the post-production, it's the mastering, it's the de-breathing, um, it's all the tweaking that I do afterwards to give it punch and make it clean. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the better you are at reading, the better you are at breathing, the less post-production you have to do. Right. But sometimes, I mean, sometimes there are just... It's every sentence you mess up. It, you just can't. It takes you ten minutes to get through a dumb paragraph, and other times you can go for five or six pages without making a, a single mistake. And I don't read the books ahead of time. This is maybe I should, but I like the the raw surprise yes, yes. that comes from my voice as I read it for the first time and I'm recording it. It's yeah. it's interesting that you say that because I'm pretty sure you posted a Facebook. Uh, video last week or something of you reading a very emotional. Yeah, uh, scene in a book. I watched that. I think I watched it probably three or four times. I was Great. blown away. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, thank you. That was very cool. If you haven't seen it, uh, you can. I think you can find it on his Facebook page. I think. The... Uh, I think Gary Compton at Tickety Boo Press uh, shared it. Um, yeah, and that was narrating "Uncommon oh, Purpose" God. by P.J. Strubber, a very uh, emotional scene, and. I was just reading through it, and I, I was like, "Oh crap! I, I think I know what's going to happen." And I teared <laughs> up. And the main character is—I mean, the main character is having the big emotional climax of the book, right? And, right. And I was like, "Ah!" Oh, and and you know, when you're really narrating, and this is the way it is in my writing too, um, the world kind of disappears. I mean, it really does. I've got earphones in. I don't hear anything when I'm writing. I've got a Lord of the Rings Pandora station going um, a lot of time, and. And and it, it it just disappears whether I'm narrating or I'm writing, mm -hmm. and I really felt like I was the main character in that scene, and all the emotion that he felt. And this is kudos to the author P.J. Schreber, just just really all of a sudden came out and uh, a little embarrassing to watch, I guess, because I am pretty teary eyed. Yeah. But oh no, it was great because sometimes I I feel kind of silly sometimes uh, when I write and it. it uh, it was not because sometimes I'll write emotional scenes. I've got a couple sure. in my book that I'm writing now, and I, I I don't I can't say that I've ever teared up writing it, but I can say that after I got done writing it, I had to sit for a minute and decompress because it was very intense for me yeah. to write that scene. Mm -hmm. After you're done and you've got so like, for well, instance, one of the scenes I have is uh, <laughs> uh, her her father dies in this scene, and it yeah. was a very like very intense scene, and I finished it. Sat back and was like, "Holy crap!" Yeah, yeah. It, well, look. I mean, if if parts of your book don't emotionally engage you, they won't emotionally engage your audience, exactly. right? Yeah. They have you have to be emotionally engaged by your own you're work. You have to be converted to your own work. Yeah, yeah. You're not you're not taking enough risks with your writing or your performance. You know, if you're if you're not feeling something, that's the yeah. And some people are going to say, "Well, that was over the top for me," and others are going to really get engaged by it. Well, you know, as long as you are, you're good. Well, and here's the thing too: is not only that, but you had the courage to share it, put it out there, and and that I think says a lot about you. Whereas a lot of people would say that's whatever, that's hokey. Well, you've had emotional times in your life, and did you have the courage to share it with other people? Yeah, like, being creative, yeah. being an artist, any type takes a lot of creative because you got to kind of put yourself out there. 
You're vulnerable, and you got to be willing to be vulnerable. I mean, there's a very, very, very dark scene in Song of Night with a character uh, from Circle of Rain where the book ends, who the book ends with. It's a big cliffhanger at the end of Circle of Rain, and there's an extremely dark scene with this character, and I didn't like it at all, uh, the feeling I got from it, but it's right. It's It's the right, and it's it's brutal, and I just I left the room after I was done writing. I like I had to escape. Pretty right. dark, you know. And <laughs> I was telling I was, I, and Josh and I went to a conference last month, and I was on the drive down, and I was telling you there's a a scene in what in my in one of my urban fantasies where I was like it's just almost too much, but then you realize you get some distance from it. It's okay because it's needed for the story. But there's there's a couple yeah. of scenes that are pretty dark and intense. So I want to ask you real quick before I forget. Um, some kind of some process questions again. So, like, sure. you write in the morning, in the evening, and and for the narration, what's the best time? Because I know you probably got to have quiet. Can have jets flying over or whatever. Yeah. So, um, well, thankfully, the the booth does a really good job, and it's in a secluded house, and we don't have airplanes flying overhead. We have tractors outside in construction, but there you go. Um, the booth does a pretty good job. It's vocalbooth.com, who I got this from, um, and re re really happy with it. Um, I, I generally try to start writing in the morning. Um, I have a very structured day because I'm studying for the LSAT, uh, possibly right. going into law school next year. Um, I, uh, I'm in school full time now, kind of a midlife crisis. I eventually will go back and get my degree. I always told myself and now I'm doing it. Um, my wife runs a wealth management company um, and owns it and I do four radio shows a week uh, in marketing in support of that. I mean my day is, and then we have four daughters, uh, beautiful, <laughs> the, the gems of the world and yeah, uh, yeah. you know, soccer, softball, play dates and this, da, 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 da. You got a full a full schedule. It sounds my like. day is very structured. That's also why, for a long time, uh, the books take a little bit longer. It's not my full time thing, and I do take audiobook gigs because I I also need to feed the family. Right. Yeah, eating uh, is always a great thing. We all yeah. my all my kids. I'm like a fan. Food. I'm a fan. <laughs> <laughs> I like food and shelter. So, yeah, I try to start in the morning. Sometimes late at night, and sometimes when. Uh, the muse just comes. You just uh, no matter what time it is, even 1:30 a.m. You have to get up. Yeah. Right. I know. What? I know a lot of our listeners like to hear like to hear um, some of those process things. And, and I mean, you've already shared so much with us. That's. I mean, I mean, I'm getting a lot of value out, out of this show and 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 whatnot. But I wanted. To, to ask you about that because that's something that everybody struggles with is right. when do I write? How do I find the time? How do I make these choices? You know, is there something? Yeah, you know, a lot of people will say, I, I think this is a mistake. Um, a lot of people will say, I can't write unless I feel inspired. And that's not true at all. You may not write well unless you're inspired, but you can write. You need, and right. so they, they avoid having a set time or a set hour that they set aside to write because they say, well, what if I'm not inspired? Guys, that, that's that's what I call PMR. That's poppycock malarkey and rubbish. That's just <laughs> absolute PMR. That's number two. Write that down. Um, yeah. Um, uh, how do you spell poppycock and malarkey? Uh, you're going to have to Google it, man. I just do my best. I just talk. But, you, you know, you got to... You, you you gotta sit down and write anyway. I don't care if you're inspired and you feel like you have writer's block. Just you gotta start writing something. Even if you have to chuck half the words you wrote, you've gotta you've still gotta writing is a dis it's a habit. You have to develop the habit of writing. Mm -hmm. And inspiration comes better to you when you have a habit of writing. Right. Get that routine, what Stephen King says, he, he waits for his muse and he makes sure his muse comes every day at 6.30 in the morning. Yeah. That's or whatever. Well, there you go. Like, like yeah. you, uh, bodybuilders who go to the gym and, and work out, they, they didn't they don't start always lifting. They feel like it, you know. No. And, 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 and they did start out until I feel like it. 500 pounds, they started out benching 100 pounds and then worked their way up. It's like, you know, some people say, I, there's no way I could write 5,000 words a day. Well, there is. You just have to practice. Like, you start out at 500 words a day, and once you get good with that, then you move to 750 and then 1,000. You just keep yeah. challenging yourself. You have to find that if writing is something that's important to you and that you find want right to do method. it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. You, and you have to look at your day and say, you know, what did you do today? You went to work and then you came home and you watched TV and you hung out with your wife and then you played video games for three hours. Well, take two of those hours and write. <laughs> yeah. and, and sit down and, and do something, you know. You get a lot of writing done in two hours, especially if it's... You a, really can. Yeah. Well, and it's, and it's interesting that you say you just have to sit down and write because a lot of... I, I know uh, a couple authors that are like, I can't write unless I'm inspired. And 
if you if you want to make money in this business of writing, then you you can't just wait for inspiration because the inspiration isn't going to pay you. Right. Well, if you're writing just for you, that's fine. Um, right. 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 And, and people say, well, I'm always writing just for me, and I I, I reject that. I I I am writing for me, um, but the amount of time emotion and everything else that I put into it, it has to be for other people too. It has to be. Right. So I got a question. <clears throat> what, and we can all argue about it. We have like three-way brawl. Sure. Um, what is more important, the idea for a story or the craft of the story? Oh, that's or a good question. maybe option three. I don't know. I'll, uh, I'll, Throw it I'll, out there. I'll take the first hit on this one. Um, I got invited to two anthologies this summer. One was the Wormhole Anthology that... All right. I had an idea for, and I just wrote it out, and it kind of changed as I was writing it. The second anthology, which I can't talk about yet, I didn't have an idea for, and I struggled for like three days, and I needed to start writing because I had a deadline, and I had no idea what the story was going to be. I just knew that I needed to have these specific characters. And so I sat down with a blank screen, and after 15 minutes of not having any ideas, I just started free writing. Mm-hmm. And and just going well. What if this and what if this and That's what, what if I this mean. and what yeah. if this and and finally I got okay. Well, this could be a good idea and this could be a good idea. And then by the time an hour had gone by, I had 1,900 words of a rough draft of a short story that wasn't anything like what I started. Sure. But it got me into that process and it got me into working it. And then I managed to knock it out. The day of it was due. I was formatting first, and it is. Yeah, um, you know, I, I I guess it's interesting because I I didn't know again with Circle of Rain. I didn't know the beginning from the end until the end arrived, and um, it was a pure discovery book. It really was, and I I don't write like that anymore. But if I hadn't just strung together different ideas. Uh, some of which made the cut and some didn't, but I just kept stringing together new ideas. I'd just write a chapter. I had no idea how that fit into anything. It didn't matter. I just I just wrote a chapter with the characters, right? and eventually a story emerged. And I, I guess what I take from that is the characters, I, I had to develop a good idea of my characters, who they were, what they were like. What This is what I do in situations with characters. I ask myself a few questions. And I and I write out the answers. What would they do in this situation or that situation? Right? Like, all right, what would they do if they sat on a porcupine? <laughs> <laughs> I know what I'd do. All right, all right. Now, <laughs> what, and and would they would they you know they jump up? Would they kill it? Or would they jump up, set it free? Um, right. What would they do if the ice cream truck? <gasps> Maybe they'd kill went it. By? it. You know, would, would, if an ice cream truck went by, are they going to get excited and chase it down? Are they going to make fun of the other kids chasing it down? Are they going to get out a dart gun and try and pop the tire? I mean, you you got to ask yourself these questions about characters. You come up with, I don't know, half a dozen scenarios. Yeah. Written, like, truly. And it doesn't matter if they're scenarios in your story. Right. Or, you know, because I write right. what would be more classical fantasy, medieval times-ish. But I still ask, what would Rain, what would Hedrin, what would Thanuel do... Uh, if they won tickets for the World Series, how would they feel? How would they look at it? How would right. they look at it? You know, and, and I, I go through this and I write it out, and this is character development. So once I have these answers of a character down, then I feel like the character's pretty well molded, and, and not completely because I'm always going to learn new things about them. Sure. But but in, in, in going back to how I said I just, I, I just kind of wrote scenes and chapters not knowing how they put together, what I take from that is my characters were trying to teach me we're trying to push through what the story was. And I'll often say in my Facebook page or to my brothers who I talk to about my writing often, I say, I learned this today yeah. from Hone Lear, the Kiron Desert Boy. I learned this today from uh, Prime Lord Emeryn Wellen. I le- and it's really like that. I learned this today from my characters. And I think that only happens when you've developed the character enough. Uh, and whether or not you translate that development is a different skill, and I, I'm right. still learning that. Well, and everything you learn about them doesn't necessarily have to go in the story. It's like uh, uh, right. a couple of years ago I heard Patrick Rothfuss talk about, and he said the general rule of thumb is when you're world building, and I wanted to ask you about world building too at some point, but sure. uh, he said that the general rule is that you use for a traditional world builder is you put 10% of what you know about your story world into the actual story. Interesting. And he said that he actually puts in only 4% because he develops his worlds to extensive detail. And so if I got same thing with character development, I don't have to put anything I know about yeah. the character mm-hmm. in there. Well, and that's like they say, uh, 
Scott and I have talked about this before when they say uh, show don't tell, and my sure. th- my theory also is on first draft always tell. So oh, let's go back. Just get yeah. it out there. Well, and, and that's like how I said action, 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 action is all I write, and then I go back and 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 description and often description through action, uh, which is showing. Um, but there are going to be times when you tell. I mean, yeah. there, there are going to be times when you when you're just gonna you're just trying to move the story along. You're already at four hundred thousand words, Brandon Sanderson, and you just need to move the story along. <laughs> and so you just tell a part, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, you, you know what? I just finished. Um, Justin Cronin's latest book, City of Mirrors. I don't know if you guys read the passage, the Twelve City of Mirrors, that series. Uh, by I him. don't know. I think that's on my wish list, actually. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. I, it's a little bit outside my wheelhouse. Uh, it's it's um, post-apocalyptic kind of kind of stuff. Uh, maybe dystopian, but it is epic dystopian, if that's a genre. And it, mm-hmm. I, 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 he. He is such a master of language, but he tells more than any other successful author I know. Ha! But you know, if it entertains he, the reader but, and keeps you engaged, it doesn't matter. But, the way, but, but, but he's at a level that's like, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm off the camera, and he's right up here as far as level of writing. <laughs> he does it so effectively. I mean, it, it just, um, it, it will transport you. But, but in general, I, I, I know I'm not at that level, so I'm going to rely on showing more than telling as much as I can. Right. It comes across as one of those, don't try this at home, kids. Because it does. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, That's what I, David Farland keeps telling me. I'm and, like, well, Sanderson and Rothfuss do this. Why can't I? And he says, because you're not at their level, jackass. Yeah. Right. Just wait a moment. Slow down there, speed racer. You'll get there. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. Like I agree. There's a lot of those. And um, I've taken some of that advice to the extreme. And then you realize you got to kind of sometimes relax and be a little more, more natural. And it comes out smoother, um, yeah. in my opinion. So. Um, Sorry, I didn't mean to swear a little bit. That was just what you know. No, just, trust me. I, I was mean, just quoting him. It's everything I can. I, I I kind of swear a lot, and it's everything I can do to keep it off the camera. So I I don't. So that was a little bit of a slip for me. It's, 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 it's emotion it. coming through again, <laughs> like an artist or something. Get all emotional. <laughs> no, that's great. How, well, well I, you said that you discovered you write your first book did, uh, with the world building aspect of things. Now that you're into the rewrites yeah. of this book, and you said that you said yesterday you you wrote. What sixty thousand words, but you cut like twenty thousand or something oh, yeah. on your first. Yeah. So do you? And and you, I don't know if you've started writing your second second book or not. Oh but yeah, ha- halfway done. Oh well, I have a rough draft, but do uh, you, I still consider that halfway. For yeah. your world building now, do you instead of just discovery writing, have you gone back and built that world more than more than you were? Yeah. Had? Um. Yeah, I guess. I mean, some of the neat things I that 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 I thought were neat anyway about the world that I created is, um, the, and th- this has no bearing on the story that we know of, but the clouds are in certain shapes depending upon what season it is. Oh, that's very cool. That, that yeah, could that could be important in the future books or something. That's interesting. The low season, which is winter, I call it the low season. They're they're great hollowed rings, hollowed rings like a big halo cloud, oh, and yeah. so it it rains. In circles, and you can stand in the middle and be dry. Circle of rain, ha ha ha. Anyway, um, <laughs> and, nice. and, and I like you know, that. That's a great visual. Yeah, there are yeah. whirlpool clouds when it's in the uh, dimming season, which is fall. I think the high season, they're they're branches like spears, and that, and there could be other shapes of clouds, but predominantly, the clouds have a shape depending on the season. That is and very cool. It's just I mean, it's it, it was neat to me. It separated it a little bit. It was a it's a do different world. Right. Um, and the, the main thing about the world that really, really helped and only came to me halfway through my writing is that the lands of my world, called Valira, they die. They cycle. They they are fertile for a time, and you can live off them. There's game, and you can farm, and whatever else. They're, they're fertile. But eventually, they are going to cycle and die. And we think you're led to believe it's a natural occurrence, and it's not too much of a spoiler that... There's a deeper reason for it. Right. But, you know, if your land dies, you've only got three options. And this provided a really <laughs> neat backdrop for me. You can stick around and, and s- try to stick Talk it out as long as you can, but you're going to die off. You will. Right. Um, you, your land's becoming a barren wasteland. It's becoming a uh, mini ice age. It, it's going to get sunk by water. Something is going to happen. So number two is you can try and find other uninhabited land currently that's fertile. And But number three is you can invade. Right. That is, ah, it. Yes. That, you know, and that that is fantastic. I love that. Um, I was going to ask you. We talked about world building, about maps, because 
Um, sometimes I've seen I've seen like some things are are um, people draw maps either before or after. There's different ways. Yeah. Some people draw the whole world. Some people draw a little part and build out. Um, but I've seen several books like uh, like in George R. R. Martin's books, the geography dictates a lot of the story because you got yeah, to get so. fingers and stuff. And so I was going to ask you about that, but what you just told us is your world building and the environment and the, and the structure really does drive the story in a lot of ways because I, it I, I think it provided a good backdrop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th that's right. It, there's a good backdrop for just being there. Yeah, it was it was an excellent backdrop, and and it forced it forces action. It forces decisions. I mean, the culture. If if you know that in decades or centuries, but you know you're going to eventually leave this land, you have a different psyche. You have it oh, yeah. as a people, right? Culture. And would you want to open intercommerce trade with other people, or would you want to keep your location a secret? You would want to keep it a secret. For it's, as long it's as so, you could, yeah. It's for as long as you can. So Circle of Rain isn't this world where the, the the kingdom of Santhara, or you know the main continent, the realm of Santhara, mm -hmm. they know hundreds of years ago their ancestors came from somewhere, but they don't know where that somewhere is. Mm -hmm. They don't know where other people's lands are. They're not interested in finding them. Because they don't they don't want to be discovered either, right? I mean, they right. want to keep their goodness a secret. But you know, eventually you're going to have to leave. You know it. That's and it also that's a very it also interesting means concept. That, that, that you you expect be... invasion as well. You right. expect invasion, right? Right. All right. That might actually be brilliant. That's my. I mean, that's 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 pretty. Oh, awesome. I thought the clouds was brilliant, but that yeah, whole... no, just taking it to the next level all the time. I, I don't actually use the term brilliant in a podcast, but when I do, it's about an idea like well, that. Well, a lot of I think how brilliant of you. That makes a lot of great <laughs> books, and and that's uh, I write predominantly science fiction, but I, I like sure. that in a lot of fantasy books, like like you're just describing how the land can change because it is a fantasy; it's not Earth. Yeah. Or in like Brandon Sanderson's book with with the ash and all that stuff for right. the first trilogy, and you're and you're thinking, man, this this world is just a desolate world, and and why is it like that? And then you find sure. out later why it is like that, and it all makes sense, and it's it's like um. There was a a uh, not a it was like a YouTube deal on George R. R. Martin's World of Ice and Fire, and one of the it was like a, a top six things you didn't know about Westeros, and it was uh, Westeros the the world doesn't have a moon, uh. and. And it, in nowhere in his books does he reference the moon at all. And that one of the theories is, one of the theories on why the seasons last as long as they do is because there is no moon. Right. Uh, so it, it's interesting that environments, especially in in fantasy fiction, play such a big role and are almost a character themselves when you yeah. talk about the overall uh, story. Yeah. And that's very uh, interesting uh, to me. You know, I, I've re that's that's interesting. I did not know that. Um, I, I hadn't thought about that, but when Josh told me that a while back, it's like, you know what, you're right. There is no moon. I released a prologue teaser of Song of Night, book two, on Facebook. I narrated it. Um, don't worry, Michael Kramer is narrating the next book. <laughs> but, uh, I, I just narrated it. It was a teaser, and I released it uh, in, in print as well on Facebook or digital. And we learn in there... The, in my world, there are two moons: first moon, second moon. Now, but in in we learned that there wasn't always a first moon. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, uh, and those mm. who have read Altar of Influence oh. know there was a fascination of the main bad guy called the Tholden Shaw, who was kind of kind of had a fascination with first moon for some reason. I don't really explain too much, but it's there. It's a. Uh, I'm very excited. I just uh, I picked up your audio uh, book last night for one of my credits. It's funny that you mentioned the whole I, I like long books thing with yeah. with listeners is they don't want to burn their credit on right. like an eight hour book. Yeah. I'm like I've got this credit. I need a fifty hour book to listen to. I'm gonna make it worth my time. Yeah. Well, Alter is about ten hours, just over, but Circle of Rain is is uh, twenty plus hours. Yeah. And, was, and which one is the which one is the first one? Well, uh, well, I, I book one is Circle of Rain, which I first released, and then I uh, very strangely went back and wrote the prequel or, or the prelude. Um, so, for uh, the listeners who haven't read your book or uh, I know what you're going to ask. <laughs> what? So, what's the order here? Uh, uh, with the all right, four well, stories in the novels. Okay, so chronologically, I'm going to write this down. 
chronologically, <laughs> altar of influence is first. Then within altar of influence, the short story remnants and shadows. So you can listen to remnants or read remnants after altar okay. of influence. That'll work. Then circle of rain, which is technically book one of the trilogy. Uh, and the red grove is a short story that fits in the timeline of circle of rain. There so those you are kind of like add-on chapters or missing chapters, kind of yeah. expansions of some sort from that. So, yeah, and some I had elements that I'd cut, but again, the short stories were really a manifestation of uh, having having writer's block and just writing a scene that developed yeah. into a full short story. Yeah, and Remnants and Shadows is dug on 14,000 words, so it's not really a short story. Maybe it's a novelita or something, you no, know. A novelette, yeah. I yeah. wrote one recently, and that's what I called it. Because yeah. I, did, I googled it, and it said that it could get, be a uh, get, Getting beyond 8,000 words, it's kind of, kind of hard to call it a short story. It's not quite a novella, but it's... Yeah. yeah. Well, we're coming up on the hour. I want to get two real quick questions in before sure. we hit our time. Uh, the first one is, I know you can't tell us a whole bunch about your... Uh, publishing success or getting your contracts and stuff, but uh, along the lines of this series, you're you're writing book two. Can you give us kind of a maybe when we can expect book two or what you've got working on for the rest right. of this year? Okay, so um, book two was supposed to be out last summer. Um, the rewrite with David Farland really did push that and put it on hold, um, but it was worth it. It I, I know the fans are. Um, I apologize, but trust me, I, I think it's going to be better. And I have some very understanding fans out there who say, "Just get it, just get it right." Whenever it is, and I appreciate that. But I am, I am working toward it. Um, with the publishing offer that came along, that again I have not yet accepted, and it's for a portion of my rights, not all of them. Okay. Um, it, it will include a a re-release of both Altar of Influence and Circle of Rain, and that will happen this year. I intend, cool. I intend to finish Song of Night this year and release it hopefully near the top of next year. And I apologize, that's probably not what I wanted to hear. Oh, no, that's fantastic. Believe me, it is so much better than it would have been had I released it last summer. As long as we know it's coming, you know, that's, that's the main thing. Um, what was the other half of your question, Josh? Uh, the other half of my question is where can people connect with you? There's two, and th this is a two-part question. One, if you, if an author is out there looking to, to hire you as a narrator, where can they go and find your work? And if you're a reader out there, where would you, you know, like to send people to go? I, you know, I think my author Facebook page is is uh, a great place. My website is another one. Um, I have a famously neglected blog. Uh, on my oh, website, <laughs> uh, which is just circleofrain.com, and rain is R-E-I-G-N, circleofrain.com. Um, my Facebook page is facebook.com forward slash Jacob Cooper, C-O-R, like circle of rain. Um, and that that is where daily I have conversations with people. Listen, I love it. You guys, I love it when you private message me. I, um, I just... I. I love talking with you. I was talking with Ben Tracy just last night and just about personal life. And he connected with me on Facebook. I've talked with many of you on Facebook, and that's where I do most of my connecting. Um, if you want to learn more or uh, contact me about um, narrating, uh, I do have a Facebook page there. It's, it's not real uh, uh, robust right now. But um, you can just, um, you know, you can email uh, Keith Mickelson Voice at uh, gmail.com. And Mickelson is like Michelson, so Keith Michelson voice at gmail dot com. Can they find? Can people find you through ACX if they yeah. know your name? Because I know yeah. I haven't been on there for a while, but I know you can search for narrators on so I, ACX. And, and here's the thing: I haven't on ACX. You can build up a really new profile and put all these samples, and I haven't done mm -hmm. that. I, I, I've, I have the profile up, but I don't have any samples. I would say just search my name, uh, Keith Michelson, Keith Mickelson, on Audible, and you'll see the 12 or 13 released works mm -hmm. that I've done. And, and an author can always. Uh, uh, send me an audition and I will send them samples. Very cool. cool. Well, thanks Jacob a whole lot for being on the show. I really enjoyed talking with you. You guys um, are great. We'd definitely like to have you on uh, again. Um, maybe My pleasure. 
maybe when book two comes out, we can have you on to talk about that. That'd be cool. That'd be, that'd be fantastic. Uh, we are doing that giveaway, right? Is it already done? We are uh, doing, well, I think I... Well, go ahead, Josh. No, go ahead, Scott. Talk about it. I, I, am, I am not a master of giveaways. This is my first one I've done. So I set it up, and there it is. It's going to be for Altar of Influence. I, there's three copies of the digital book, um, the Kindle version, and available on Amazon. So we're putting the link up on our Facebook page. You click on it, and basically you have to watch some of this video, I guess. That's the qualifier. And then you go through the steps to do the do the giveaway. It's going to run for 15 days. So if you know people that, that are still interested and they still want to check it out, um, they can they can follow that link from our, from our Keystroke Medium Facebook page, and uh, and and share that. So fantastic! Thank you for doing that. No, well, uh, Jacob, if you hang out for just a minute while I cut off the feed, then we'll get out okay. of here. Um, guys, this has been a great show. You've been listening to live, as always, for Scott Moon. I am Josh Hayes. Together we are Keystroke Medium. We hope to come back next week for the show. And take it easy. Have a good week. See you later. See you.